Good morning, and John, thank you very much for your very kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to be here at UCF. Uh, you have uh, invited me many times to talk about a topic that's uh, near to my heart. Um, I think if I were meeting with the new president-elect, uh, I would begin by pointing out what the economic crisis has done in Latin America. For the past five years, prior to this current economic downturn, commodity prices were very high. Latin American countries made a lot of profit, and their GDP went up, in some cases, spectacularly. Some countries worked hard to diversify their exports, fully aware that commodity prices historically fluctuate. Others, despite centuries of experience with such fluctuations, chose not to make the effort required to develop more value-added exports. And now the inevitable downturn has arrived. Nevertheless, what countries did with their increased pros prosperity is really quite varied and interesting. Some reduced poverty among their citizens. According to the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, Mexico, and Venezuela have achieved impressive results in reducing poverty during the period of high commodity prices. Others, like Argentina, despite GDP growth at rates of over 8% during this period, still have high poverty rates. Brazil and Argentina have paid off their debt to the IMF, but Argentina must still reschedule or repay more than $6 billion in defaulted debt to Paris Club members. And finally, Brazil, Chile, and Venezuela are also using some of their increased earnings to buy expensive military weapon systems. Now, at the beginning of this crisis, several countries in the region believed that their growth had been so great, their markets so diversified, and their stock markets so robust that their economies were as they put it, delinked from that of the United States. But the crisis spread, and demand for their commodities plummeted. Argentina, for example, taxes its grain exports. Pardon all the technical equipment here. I, I sprained a leg doing some hiking a few months ago, and it's uncomfortable still to stand on both legs. OK, if, if this isn't enough, I'll stand up again. Um, so Argentina has been taxing exports of soya to China, for example, and using that to subsidize some of the Argentine energy costs, an unsustainable, unsustainable policy approach. And now that the prices are down, Argentina is going to have a very tough time continuing with those subsidies. Um, Venezuela's government. President Chavez exulted when the crisis hit the United States, but now that the demand for and the cost of petroleum have dropped, the Chavez government may not be able to balance its budget. Other petroleum producers, which have pushed their weight around internationally with petrodollars, such as Russia and Iran, are in the same fix. However, as distinct from earlier financial crisis, and this is very important, many Latin American countries today have large international reserves. Now, most countries in Latin America and the Caribbean are market-oriented, democratically inclined. They follow good macroeconomic policies, and they seek to benefit from a globalized world economy. Please note, however, that these market-oriented democracies include Peru, Brazil, Uruguay, and Chile, all of which are governed by left-of-center presidents. They generally agree on market economies, a reduced role for the state, trade expanding agreements, and keeping inflation low. But they also differ on many issues, including social policies. A few governments, such as Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela, reject globalization, do not follow good macroeconomic policies, and seek to strengthen the president's role and the state control of the economy. Inflation has risen above 20 above 20% in both Venezuela and Argentina, although both governments deny it officially. And finally, although public opinion show in Latin America that uh, 
support for democracy is low, and this is something that should concern us, these polls also reveal that little by little, there is a growing belief in the region that only market forces create economic growth. Unfortunately, the present economic crisis encourages those who oppose globalization, those who favor protectionism, and those who want to blame their difficulties on others. Political radicalization in countries like Honduras and Nicaragua, which have formal free trade agreements with the United States, indicate that the approach that we have followed since 1990, that is, offering trade and investment, has simply no longer sufficient. The United States, however, can play a role for Latin America and the Caribbean in recovering from this economic crisis. And the most obvious way is through the recovery of our own economy. For most countries in the region, the US is still the single most important export destination. The only exceptions are Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, and Paraguay. As our economy recovers, Americans will buy more from Latin America, thereby helping the nation's recovery. In addition, US investment in the region will rise. As credit becomes more available in the US, Latin America, which is traditionally looked to the US for export credits, will be able to export more. And finally, as the American economy rebounds, remittances to Latin America and the Caribbean will regain their traditional strength. But the US is capable of doing much more for Latin America, and our president should take advantage of that. Today, the media describes the United States' influence in Latin America as weak. A key reason for that is that the invasion of Iraq demonstrated to Latin Americans that the US was prepared to use force unilaterally. Use of force by the United States in Latin America has concerned Latin American leaders and thinkers since those countries gained their independence from the European powers that founded them. Further, despite President George W. Bush's expressed interest in Latin America when first elected in the year 2000, the events of 9-11 and other priorities have eclipsed Latin America in Washington since 2001. The United States must adjust to the reality that Latin American countries deserve respect in managing their own country's affairs as we help them integrate into a globalized economic community. We must understand that most of the region's problems can only be addressed successfully by the governments of the Caribbean and Latin America themselves. Once those governments recognize the need for change, and take responsibility for it, the US should be prepared to support their efforts. Every country in Latin America developed differently from the others and at a different pace. They will continue to do that as their leaders learn what each country must do to become competitive in a globalized world. There is no one size fits all strategy for the region in order to grow their economies, create jobs and reduce poverty and inequality. What worked in one country may not work anywhere else. Further, a left of center government in one country will not follow the same internal or foreign policies of other leftist governments in the region. Even though the Cold War ended two decades ago, the outdated perceptions of that struggle continue to shape areas of US foreign policy, particularly our relations with Latin America and the Caribbean. US interests have changed the time has come for the United States to adopt new strategies. For starters, the tutelary tone we have used with Latin America and the Caribbean for far too long should be abandoned for an approach that offers partnership rather than implying subordination. In the 21st century, the United States should offer assistance in a careful, cooperative way as Latin American countries assert themselves more strongly in the world agenda. At the same time, the US should also make clear its interest in promoting democracy, good governance, and open markets in order to strengthen the region's competitiveness in a globalized world. Washington should understand that US policies must adjust to rapidly changing reality in the Western Hemisphere. There is no question, no question at all, that some of the developments in the region are worrisome, and this is inevitable. As Latin America further embraces the world and becomes a player with a stake in world affairs, circumstances and challenges will not always develop in a manner 
that dovetails neatly with U.S. interests. The decline of U.S. In of influence is an indication that, because of globalization, the governments of the region are looking beyond the Western Hemisphere to participate in a global economic system. Globalization encourages diversification of trade and global interdependence, thus strengthening the self-confidence of countries in this hemisphere and reducing their dependence on the United States. What do countries in Latin America and the Caribbean need? Ask anybody, go anywhere, and they will tell you the concerns are three, jobs, poverty, and crime. Dig a little deeper, and experts agree the region needs help with globalization, specifically competitiveness. The region needs to diversify its exports beyond commodities to include more value-added products. They also need to diversify their trade partners so that an economic downturn in one major trading partner does not affect them as much as it has in the past. Now, it's important to promote globalization. It's globalization, not the Cold War, that has been the dominant force for change in the world in the past 50 years. Globalization is a somewhat frightening concept, but it's here to stay, regardless of whether certain governments oppose it. Globalization, like a force of nature, can sweep aside antiquated and dysfunctional customs, institutions, and ways of thinking. It's not something that can be stopped by a leader or by a nation without incurring absolutely unacceptable costs. Globalization may be a force, but if shaped and directed, it need not be a blind force. And while globalization brings problems, it also can bring extraordinary benefits to peoples and nations such as ideas, reforms, good jobs, and investments. In fact, it has altered our relationship with Latin America much more than Americans understand. Trade, once an exotic appetizer, is now the main course in promoting growth. This is particularly true in terms of working our way out of the current economic crisis. But promoting trade and investment is not enough. Our next president has an opportunity to offer cooperation that will help middle-income countries in Latin America become more competitive. But this assistance should be on, offered only after their leaders, on their own, have adopted reforms that contribute to competitiveness. Competitiveness is a wide open game. It can be increased through education, strengthening the rule of law and the administration of justice, market regulation, improving infrastructure, institution building, ensuring property rights and the sanctity of contracts, equitable taxation, and, of course, reducing tax evasion, a favorite pastime in Latin America. Reducing corruption and increasing the size of the formal economy while reducing the informal economy are absolutely basic. The range of reforms that strengthen competitiveness offers wide scope to any donor country or international financial organization willing to provide capacity building or economic aid. Now, in December 2007, in a rare display of bipartisanship, the administration and the Democrats in Congress approved the free trade agreement with Peru. This bipartisanship should continue in 2009. The Congress should also approve the free trade agreements with Colombia and Panama. If these agreements are not approved, the U.S. will have let down two Democratic allies. They will have made the case for those in Latin America who accuse the U.S. of turning its back on the region and abandoned a strategic pillar of our support for democracy. That said, our president should understand that trade expansion and greater access to the U.S. market are no longer sufficient as catalysts to promote hemispheric growth. We have to develop broader shared concerns and consensus in the region. Reducing poverty in the region should be a priority not only for the Latin Americans and the Caribbeans, but also for the United States. Latin America has the highest wealth inequality of all the world's regions. 13 million people in Latin America escaped poverty in 2004 and 2005, but 200 million people still remain mired there, living on as little as one or two dollars a day. The most unequal economies, such as Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, should do much more to balance growth, but at the same time to reduce 
the unequal distribution of wealth. There, are, there is one case here which I would press to the new president, and that's some unfinished business that we began a long time ago, and we're nowhere near a solution. Since 2000, President George W. Bush has negotiated free trade agreements with 10 countries in Latin America and has increased U.S. economic assistance on a global basis. However, in Latin America, his two administrations concentrated their assistance on anti-drug and counter-terrorism programs in Colombia. America has waged the war on drugs for over 30 years, but we still have no end game. It should not be surprising, therefore, that public opinion polls taken during this recent general election campaign show that the majority of Americans believe that our current approach is ineffective. In 1992, President George Herbert Walker Bush agreed with the presidents of Mexico and the Andean region that the U.S. would cooperate with those governments to reduce drug trafficking based on the principle of shared responsibility. That is, supplier countries and consumer countries would share responsibility for a problem that hurt their citizens, their societies, and their economies. Washington agreed to reduce U.S. demand uh, for and consumption of drugs, and the producing countries would get U.S. help to reduce production and drug smuggling. Sixteen years after that meeting, the United States has not reduced drug consumption and demand significantly. Since 1990s, the harmful effects of drug trafficking have spread to many more countries, not only in this hemisphere, but also in Europe and Africa. Cocaine consumption is increasing throughout Latin America, including in Brazil and Mexico. Brazil is now the second largest consumer of cocaine in the world, and Spain now has the highest per capita of consumption of cocaine in the world. The judicial systems and the law enforcement capacity of small democracies in Central America and the Caribbean and, need I say it, West Africa, are being overwhelmed by the corruption and crime fed by drugs smuggled through and around them to the U.S. All countries in the region are struggling with increased crime. The U.S. must help them. In Brazil, criminals associated with drugs are able to challenge state authority in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. In August 2007, President Lula announced a U.S. $3.3 billion uh, program to combat violent crime in Brazil. And I would propose to the next president that if Brazil asked the U.S. for help in fighting transnational crime, we should provide it. Mexico's President Calderon is serious about combating narco-trafficking and the crime it generates. He has repeatedly said he wants more help from the U.S. Since more illegal drugs entered the U.S. from Mexico than any other place, the U.S. has complied. In October 2007, the two governments announced the Merida Initiative, a multi-year program to combat drug trafficking, transnational crime and terrorism in Mexico and Central America. President Bush requested an initial $500 million for Mexico and U.S. $50 million for Central America. Frankly, I doubted that Congress would fund it, but they did, but at the levels proposed by the administration, which are simply inadequate. Our new president should request increased funding for this initiative, whose success is critical for the future of the Caribbean basin. Now, in terms of running out of time here, John, in terms of specific suggestions, I have emphasized that helping our own economy to recover is perhaps the most potent tool for helping the region recover. I have also explained why the U.S. must do much more to help the Caribbean Basin deal with narco-trafficking. I have refrained, however, from offering suggestions about normalizing relations with Cuba and reforming immigration. Such changes, which would be very much welcomed in Latin America and the Caribbean, unfortunately, are tremendously difficult for us to deal with. Both of them intertwine foreign and domestic policy. And not only that, just discussion of them raises enormous emotional response. I really don't think that our next president is going to be able to deal with that in any really meaningful way in his first term. But I do have some other ideas. It usually takes several months before a new president has his entire executive branch team 
in order so that he can begin to pursue his agenda. But real life challenges seldom coincide with the political calendar. One challenge coming up soon is the summit of the Americas Conference of the region's leaders. It will be held in April 2009 in Trinidad and Tobago. The first summit of the American Conference, uh, Conference of the Americas was held in Miami in 1994. Some of you may recall that. And that conference was supposed to move the region toward working together on common challenges as well as eventually joining to form the free trade area of the Americas. Now, summit meetings have been held periodically since then, but without great deal of forward motion. And the free trade area of the Americas paradigm gradually lost its allure in the region for a variety of reasons. Our new president could choose to use the American participation in the April summit primarily as a symbolic venue for meeting the region's leaders. But he could also use it as a platform to create a new cooperative agenda in which the United States demonstrates a willingness to re-engage with the region. Instead of using trade and investment as the prime motor for movement, the US should try to develop a common regional agreement involving issues such as education, climate change, energy, or strengthening financial systems in the hemisphere. God knows, if the region doesn't know it needs to reform those systems, it never will. Even before Trinidad and Tobago, our new president should appoint a special envoy for the Americas. This position, used very skillfully by President Clinton, succeeded in demonstrating genuine UN interest in working with other countries in the region. In today's divided Latin America and the Caribbean, this position could be a strong signal that the US is willing to cooperate with regional democracies, whether of the right or the left. The envoy could travel throughout the region, not only getting to know all the region's leaders and their concerns, but also trying to find common themes on which the hemisphere could work together. One such theme might be to develop a common hemispheric position prior to the 2009 Copenhagen meeting on climate change. Another might be trying to develop a common program on issues crucial to competitiveness, such as rule of law, corruption, and reducing the large informal sector in Latin America. Finally, another possibility might be to promote a hemispheric conference to develop more effective strategies for dealing with narco trafficking. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to Mr. John Barcea, uh, Ms. Kay Semyon, uh, the University of Central Florida, and all of the other sponsors of this event. I'm just delighted uh, to be here, and thank you all for, for coming and taking time out of your busy schedules as well. Uh, Never before has South Asia figured so prominently in a U.S. presidential race as it has over the last year. For those of us who have been following South Asia issues for several years, and we remember times when previous presidential candidates, who will remain unnamed, uh, could not even name the president of Pakistan a few years ago, uh, it was quite shocking to, to see Pakistan discussed in depth in three out of the four presidential debates. So whether it was the revived Taliban insurgency in Afghanistan, the prolonged instability in Pakistan where al-Qaeda remains entrenched, or the recently completed U.S.-India civil nuclear deal, South Asia remained in the foreign policy spotlight uh, throughout most of the U.S. presidential campaign. I'm going to discuss today where I think the Obama administration is headed on the region, and I'll also provide a few of my own suggestions for U.S. policy in the years to come. I know the talk is titled India and in South Asia, uh, but I'm going to start by discussing the situation in Afghanistan, because I think that is the issue that will demand the immediate attention of the new administration. Uh, there will be no honeymoon period as such on Afghanistan, uh, and it will be absolutely critical that President-elect Obama signal immediately his willingness to dedicate the time, the resources, and the leadership 
uh, that is necessary to stabilize the situation there and to demonstrate that the U.S. is committed uh, over the long term to stabilizing Afghanistan. To its credit, the Bush administration has recognized that there would be little time for a new administration to conduct a full-up review of the situation in Afghanistan before the elections there, which are scheduled to be held in September. So what the Bush administration has done is it's conducted its own policy review uh, of the situation, which is rapidly deteriorating, and it seeks to put in place a sustainable plan that will carry the Obama administration at least through the first six months of 2009. So of course, the new administration has the prerogative to change course as they see fit. However, I think having a sound strategy already in place can help prevent the situation from slipping further during this critical transition period. The challenges in Afghanistan are daunting. Despite the provision of over $26 billion in U.S. assistance since 2001, the presence of nearly 65,000 U.S. and allied forces, and the involvement of over 40 nations in the rehabilitation of the country, the Taliban are gaining ground and violent attacks have increased substantially in the last two years. The international coalition is fragmented and it lacks agreement on the core mission in Afghanistan. And although Taliban fighters and commanders have found refuge in Pakistan since early 2002, it is only very recently that the U.S. bureaucracy has begun to integrate its Afghanistan and Pakistan policies in a really meaningful way. But there are some recent positive developments on which a new U.S. administration can build. The Bush administration has already committed 4,500 additional troops to Afghanistan that begin arriving in January. Sending new troops is important. It signals that the U.S. Uh, remains committed uh, to stabilizing Afghanistan. But of course, equally important is how the troops will engage once they are on the ground. It should be clear to the Afghan people that the troops are there for their security, to secure them. Recent Afghan uh, civilian casualties resulting from coalition operations are beginning to erode popular support for having any kind of international presence, uh, international force presence there. So I think the, the new administration will have to reverse this trend and they'll have to do this in part uh, by refraining at times from air operations targeting terrorists. They're really gonna have to weigh these operations carefully. Um, I think a, a new U.S. administration can also help the situation by spending more time nurturing the positive uh, dynamics that we see developing between Afghan President Hamid Karzai and Pakistani President Asif Ali Zardari. Uh, it seemed that President Karzai had a good relationship with uh, Benazir Bhutto, uh, and, and that is continuing through uh, her husband, Asif Ali Zardari. So the U.S. wants to build on that. Um, ultimately, it is the Pakistan and Afghan militaries that have to cooperate along the border. But I think encouraging the political relationship between the political leaders um, can certainly lay the foundation for increased trade, people-to-people -people links, and eventually lead to more effective border security cooperation. Let me just say a few words about India's role in Afghanistan, because I, I think this is, India can have a positive role in Afghanistan, and I think the Obama administration should encourage it. Uh, India being a multi-religious, multi-ethnic democracy, successful democracy, uh, has much to teach Afghanistan, who's trying to develop its own uh, democratic institutions. Um, there is a lot of suspicion among Pakistanis about the increased Indian role uh, in Afghanistan, Pakistanis claim that the Indian consulates are being used to actually fund uh, insurgents, Baluch insurgents in Pakistan's Baluchistan province um, and other nefarious matters. And certainly the U.S. Uh, can take a role in bringing some ground truth to the situation, uh, you know, discerning what is Pakistani paranoia and what really uh, might be happening. Um, so I think this is a delicate issue. 
But I do think there, there are benefits to having India have a role in Afghanistan and that uh, Pakistan needs to understand that uh, there, there are some positive benefits and it cannot expect the U.S. to limit an Indian role that might otherwise help stabilize the situation. Let me briefly address the recent media hype surrounding the idea of talking with the Taliban. This is something we've all been reading a lot about in the press. Clearly, the coalition forces need to have a comprehensive strategy that includes not only a military plan, but also a plan for political reconciliation, reconstruction, development. Um, and I would argue that while the idea of peeling off lower level Taliban uh, fighters who may not be ideologically committed to the cause, but are more mercenaries, uh, would be worth the effort. Um, I would say we, we have to be careful not to overestimate the willingness of the senior Taliban leadership to break their ties to al-Qaeda. Uh, they certainly had the opportunity to do this right after 9-11. The U.S. worked very hard in that regard, and they decided not to. So it is not clear to me why they would decide to do that now when they are actually making gains in Afghanistan. Uh, so I think the Obama administration will have to tread very cautiously uh, on this issue. Uh, and avoid pursuing policies based on wishful thinking, because I think there is a lot of that out there right now. Uh, and it, this brings up the, a point that um, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Lutis, uh, raised when he talked about the Iran nuclear issue and how sometimes you have to sort of go in an opposite direction so that you can come back to your original strategy more forcefully. And, and I would argue this is what Pakistan um, is doing, has tried to do, uh, in terms of dealing with the problem of the militancy in the tribal areas. Uh, what they argued with the U.S. is they needed to pursue peace deals uh, so that if they had to come back more forcefully with military operations, they would get the support of the public because they had tried the negotiating route. And so, in fact, they did that in the spring. But in, and now they're, they're back pursuing military operations, um, particularly in the Bajor Agency of the tribal areas, also in the Swat Valley, which is in the settled area of the Northwest Frontier Province. But there were costs to this policy. And the costs were American lives. Uh, this, you know, providing latitude to the militants through the peace deals allowed them to cross over in Afghanistan, um, attack coalition forces, as well as Afghan civilians. Um, so I think we need to keep all of this in mind when we, when we start to talk about talks and reconciliation. You have to go in with your eyes wide open and you have to realize the dangers and the costs and calculate are they worth it, you know, and, and are we negotiating in fact from a position of strength or is it being interpreted as weakness or even surrender to the enemy. Let me turn to Pakistan. Um, I recently co-chaired an independent bipartisan um, working group on Pakistan. And about 13 US-based Pakistan experts got together about once a month. We had uh, US officials come in and brief us. Uh, many of us traveled to Pakistan. And our work culminated in the publishing of a report of recommendations for the new US administration on how to pursue Pakistan policy. And that report is called Pakistan and the United States, the next chapter. And I'll just point out that we brought a stack of reports that are uh, right outside the door uh, on the table, the registration table, if you'd like to pick one up. Uh, we'll make it easier for us, because then we won't have to cart it all the way back to Washington, DC. <laughs> but in the report, we argue for continued US-Pakistan engagement based on the assumption that there is scope for a broad-based, mutually beneficial relationship between our two countries. We acknowledge, however, that the counterterrorism issue could overshadow the relationship and lead to a serious deterioration of our relations if we fail to cooperate on the counterterrorism issue. President-elect Obama has the very difficult challenge of moving the U.S.-Pakistan relationship away from its current turbulent track um, and setting it on a more even keel. Now, I'll just point out, reading the Pakistani press, uh, you know, Pakistanis are just elated by the election of uh, Obama. And I think there is a lot of um, positive feeling and hope 
that there will be enormous change. And I would just like to add a note of caution and note that their expectations you know, may be a bit high. While I think um, President-elect Obama probably will be able to build bridges with the Muslim community worldwide, you know, based on his background, based, you know, he's a fresh face. I think as much as President Bush tried to do this, and I think he had some very good policies, but it was just very difficult for him to do it uh, based on the uh, Iraq and, and some of the other issues. So I do, while I do think there is an opportunity, and I've, I read today that uh, they're considering uh, Obama doing a speech within the first 100 days of his presidency directly directed toward the Muslim world. I think that would be an extremely positive um, thing to do. But at the same time, uh, the U.S. sort of laser-like focus on uprooting the terrorism from the tribal areas of Pakistan is not going to change. So that, that is something that, that will remain a very difficult issue uh, between the U.S. and Pakistan uh, for a while. Uh, I would say the Bush administration m made a major mistake in its Pakistan policy, and that was not convincing Pakistan to break all ties to the Taliban directly following the 9-11 attacks. The U.S. instead rewarded and praised Pakistan for apprehending key al-Qaeda leaders in the period from 2002 to 2005, but it virtually ignored Pakistan, the Pakistan government's lax attitude toward the Taliban. Um, and I would argue that because of the lack of a consistent and systematic Pakistani policy to rein in extremists and the ongoing war in Afghanistan, of course, has led to the development of the dangerous terrorist safe haven that we see on the tribal areas where you have various militant groups loosely coordinating their activities and increasingly challenging the writ of the Pakistan government itself. Now, Obama has talked tough on Pakistan during the campaign. Um, he's repeatedly threatened to take unilateral military action if Pakistan was unwilling or unable to take out the terrorists themselves. Um, but I believe, in fact, uh, when he takes the reins of power here in a couple of months, uh, the Obama administration will, will see that it must find a way to work jointly with Pakistan. Uh, I think tackling the, the terrorist threat in the, in the tribal areas is going to require a long-term, multifaceted effort, which will include large-scale economic assistance, a comprehensive effort to undermine the ideologies that drive the various groups, and a new political dispensation for this region, which has a semi-autonomous status outside of Pakistan proper. Um, parties, political parties are not allowed to operate in this area, and although you have um, officials that get elected to the Pakistani parliament, they can't uh, do any business related to the tribal areas. So you have this kind of strange system where the center is controlling uh, the region, the, the president, it's controlled through the president, um, but the area that's directly adjacent to it, the Northwest Frontier Province, has its own chief minister, its own government, but does not have authority in the areas that lie uh, directly next to it and that you know, share the Pashtun identity. Etc. So it's, it's really not a system that functions well, and this is something that's going to have to change. U.S. economic assistance has already begun to flow to the tribal areas, with uh, USAID allocating $90 million in fiscal year 2008 for projects in education, health, road building, and economic growth. The U.S. Congress also is considering legislation that establishes reconstruction opportunity zones in the border regions of both Afghanistan and Pakistan that would provide U.S. duty-free access for goods that are produced there. So these are the kind of positive steps that the Obama administration can focus on uh, in terms of, of building up um, a better image of the U.S. in Pakistan and also really dealing with some of the core issues there. There also is a need to reform Pakistan's premier intelligence agency, the Inter-Services Intelligence Directorate, or ISID. Before her assassination, Benazir Bhutto herself told an interviewer that unless the Pakistani security apparatus is reformed, it would be difficult to dismantle the terrorist networks that now threaten the unity of the Pakistani state. Uh, the Pakistani Chief of Army Staff, General Kiani, has taken some steps in this direction in the last couple of months. 
He's appointed a new ISID chief, and he has reportedly dismissed several ISI officials who had connections to the bombing of the Indian Embassy in Afghanistan on July 7th. Let me now turn to India. Um, Dr. Ludis mentioned how we have to look for new allies, we have to seek out new partnerships to meet the needs of the 21st century, and I think he rightly pointed to India as, as one of those countries. Um, if you look at sort of the history, brief history of the U.S.-India relationship, uh, you could argue that relations between the U.S. and India really started to improve in the early 90s following India's uh, adop adoption of a uh, serious economic reform program. But sort of lingering suspicion from the Cold War era, the India-Pakistan tensions, which had resulted in three major military crises in the period from 1990 to 2002, and the 1998 nuclear test, certainly pre precluded a genuine strategic engagement. Now, President Clinton's famous 2000 visit to India certainly created mutual good feelings, but I would argue it wasn't until President Bush came into office with a broader vision for the relationship that we witnessed a substantive shift in our ties. U.S. relations have changed dramatically uh, over the last seven years with India, and I would say India is no longer seen through just the South Asia prism but it's seen as an emerging global power that can play a significant role in contributing to security and stability in the broader Asia region. So although India's uh, expanding, reforming economy was the primary driver to building ties, I would say it was after 9-11 that U.S. officials began to realize the significance of India being the world's largest multi-ethnic, multi-religious democracy and American interest in India at that point started to gain an ideological foundation. And this is why India is often labeled a natural partner for the United States. And there's clearly strong bipartisan support in the US Congress for building strategic ties to India. And some congressional members have even called the US relationship with India one of the most important in the 21st century. So that's quite a statement, uh, I think, if we think about that. Certainly the most tangible sign of the new U.S.-India relationship is reflected in the recent passage of the U.S.-India civil nuclear deal. Completing this deal marks a significant departure from the past when U.S.-India ties were really constrained and prevented from meeting their potential by a misunderstanding over the nuclear issue. So I think this will go a long way in deepening our, our strategic relationship. Another area where relations are improving is our military-to-military -military ties. Indian and U.S. Armed Forces have conducted over 50 joint exercises in the last six years, and they have signed a 10-year defense framework agreement in June 2005. One of the most significant of these exercises occurred in the fall of 2007, when India hosted a joint naval exercise in the Bay of Bengal with the U.S., Japan, Australia, and Singapore. So increasing our defense trade will help provide the substance and the depth to our strategic partnership. India is currently the third largest arms importer in the world, and analysts expect India to purchase around 40 billion worth of armaments in the next five years. India has, of course, long relied on Russia for its arms supplies, and about 80% of its existing military equipment is of Russian origin. However, Indian strategic planners complain about the quality and the reliability of the Russian equipment, and they're increasingly looking to advance systems from the United States. And I think this past spring sale of the six uh, Hercules military transport aircraft worth one billion U.S. dollars is the largest U.S. military sale to India ever, and hopefully marks the beginning of a, a much more substantial defense trade relationship. So it's likely that the Obama administration will carry forward this trend uh, set by President Bush of deepening U.S.-India ties. But it's not clear to me that Obama himself has the same clarity of vision and force of determination to extend the partnership 
that we saw from Bush, especially in the way he personally pushed through the civil nuclear deal. And I, I will say that I think uh, when we reflect back on Bush's legacy, I mean, it's very easy to uh, target him. Uh, there have been many mistakes, but I think what he did for the U.S.-India partnership will be remembered as an important legacy issue for him. Uh, Obama has recently made comments on the importance of resolving Kashmir to stabilize Afghanistan, and this has certainly raised some eyebrows in India. Uh, of course, India-Pakistan talks, bilateral talks, have been progressing on their own for the last four years, and I think any effort to inject a U.S. or international role in the process could actually set it back. Uh, you know, that said, there is a role for the U.S. to quietly prod the two sides, to take confidence-building measures along a, a range of issues. Uh, and in fact, we just had a, a major confidence-building measure, which was the opening of the road linking Muzaffarabad in Pakistani <coughs> Kashmir to Srinagar in Indian Kashmir, a road that hadn't been opened uh, in 60 years uh, to trade. So this is a major development. I remember being in Muzaffarabad several years ago when I served as a diplomat in Pakistan and seeing the sign that said, uh, you know, Srinagar, I don't know, 100, 120 kilometers, whatever it was, and just thinking, oh, you know, that's, that's so unfortunate, you know, pretty soon that sign will come down and, you know, never will happen. Well, look, you know, look where we are, 2008. So it is possible um, to build confidence between these two countries. And I think Prime Minister Singh said it, and former President Musharraf agreed, making the line of control irrelevant. Uh, the line of control divides Pakistani and Indian Kashmir. Uh, so I think that things are moving in a positive direction, but I think the minute if the Obama administration tries to come in, you know, put Kashmir at the top of the agenda, you know, somehow in inject a, a more public U.S. role, that we risk actually setting the process back. Um, but I do think that the biggest source of friction between the U.S. and India in an Obama regime is likely to be over the outsourcing issue. I think we almost certainly will see a protectionist wave uh, when it comes to trade policy and even possibly the active discouragement of companies from outsourcing jobs. And, and this will be a source of friction. I don't think it's a, you know, a, a, a game changer or, um, you know, it will disrupt relations completely. Uh, there will be other areas uh, that will be more important, but this will be a source of friction, certainly. I would argue that one area that we need to focus on expanding our cooperation with India is in countering terrorism. Despite a convergence of U.S. and Indian views on the need to contain terrorism, we have failed to work as closely as we should to minimize this threat, and this has to do with uh, past suspicions and um, apprehensions uh, that I think we need to overcome. Recent attacks in India, including bombings in Bangalore, Jaipur, Ahmedabad, and New Delhi, reveal that homegrown terrorism is a growing concern in India. And I think uh, we both stand to benefit by upgrading our counterterrorism dialogue. We've had a counterterrorism joint working group uh, established in 1999 uh, that continues, but it's, it's been uh, not really producing much, uh, not meeting very frequently at a very high level. Uh, so we need to upgrade that and increase the number of our exchanges on topics such as organizing and streamlining, streamlining local and national security forces and improving homeland security technologies. So I mentioned the contribution of India's economic reforms to the U.S. initial interest in building ties to India. And India has certainly made substantial progress in reforming its economy, has achieved growth rates of about 8 to 9 percent over the last several years, although these rates are set to decline because of the global financial crisis. Um, but there are still many challenges in the economic realm that remain for India. Um, and it needs to address these if it's going to sustain growth levels that will begin to lift out of poverty the two-thirds of its population that still lives on less than two dollars a day. Let me uh, jump to India-China relations. I just want to say a few brief words. I think it's important. Uh, as the relationship between the U.S. and India grows, we're going to have to be aware and, and focus on 
the dynamics in the India-China relationship. I think while on the surface it looks like their relations are improving, certainly trade is catapulted up to 40 billion, increasing eightfold in the last six years. Both sides continue to harbor deep suspicions of the other strategic intentions, and they still have disputed border issues that they have not been able to move on despite talks that have been gone ongoing for almost 30 years now. Um, and certainly, uh, India saw that uh, China's uh, attempt to scuttle the civil nuclear agreement at the 2008 Nuclear Suppliers Group meeting in September, uh, this was evidence for many Indians that China does not willingly accept India's rise in the world stage, nor the prospect of closer U.S.-India ties. So I think this is something that uh, the U.S. will just have to continue to watch and think about ways it can increase its multilateral engagement with India through initiatives such as the U.S.-Japan-India trilateral talks that was first initiated by former Prime Minister, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. So certainly the next administration has a very firm basis on which to build the U.S.-India partnership. And as Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said recently, the civil nuclear agreement unlocks a new and far broader world of potential for our strategic partnership in the 21st century, not just on nuclear cooperation, but on every area of national endeavor. So maximizing the potential for this relationship will be one of the most important jobs of President-elect Obama. And that completes my remarks, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you.